joining us now is Kelly Fisher from Hennepin County Emergency Management and Wes Nichols from Pro Tree Outdoor Services. Today we are going to talk about storm awareness and safety. What steps should our audience take to prevent their trees or large branches from falling and damaging a house or a building, a vehicle, or taking down power lines? You're going to want to start at the bottom of the tree and work your way up. So the first thing you want to look at is you're going to want to go take a complete three walk around the entire tree, look at the root plate of the tree, make sure there's no heaving of the root plate, then work your way up and look at the, the, the trunk flare of the tree, make sure that that's all intact, that there's no decay pockets there or any, or any fungal growth on the, the root plate of the tree. And then, and then make your way up. Look, you're going to want to look for uh, co-dominant stems, which are two, can two trunks competing for one canopy. And sometimes when those come together, we get a bark inclusion. So if, if there's something like that, you might, you might want to take a close look for that. Um, you know, look for weakly attached branch unions, look for broken branches, dead wood. I've done my tree inspection. At what point do I know that this is something that I need to call somebody immediately about or something that maybe I can wait a week or two or a month out? Well, there's a lot of great tree companies here in the metro area. And um, you know, most, most of us that are arborists, if, if you call and you have a question, even if you just want us to come out and take a look at it, we, we'll, we'll do that you know, without a charge. Um, so if, if, if you're worried about it or you're concerned about it, j just call. You know, it, it, takes, it takes five minutes to get on the phone with someone, schedule an appointment, have them come out, take a look at it. If there's an issue, you know, they can generally provide you a quote right away to correct the problem. So what's the best time of year that people should look or inspect their trees? We would recommend that you take a look at your trees uh, any time during the dormancy season. So, you know, after the leaves drop in the fall, through the winter, early spring. Uh, when there's no foliage on the trees, it's a lot easier for us to do an inspection. We're able to see the branching structure of the tree and we're able to point out any of those defects or structural issues a lot easier. So how often should people trim their trees? You know, a lot of it's dependent on species location, site conditions, age of the tree, um, you know, and you're, you're going to want to talk to talk to an arborist who, who is familiar with all those different things to figure out, you know, a, a regular pruning or maintenance plan. But I would say on average, you know, most trees need pruning every three to seven years. If you really are concerned or care about your trees, you should have a trained arborist come out and look at your trees and have somebody uh, trim your trees on a regular basis. Oh, definitely. Okay. Yeah, especially if you're trying to prevent, you know, storm damage to your home, your property. Um, it, it's, and you know, trees add a lot of value to your property. So it, they're worth investing in. So now Kelly, I'm gonna ask you, what precautions should people take um, other than trees um, before a storm to prevent damage to their home, their vehicles, um, and their property? Okay, so a lot of times what you'll get is you'll get these, uh, the weather report will say that there's a storm coming within a day or two. And that really should, uh, should really prompt you to start looking around your yard and start thinking what are the things that are most likely going to blow around. And some of these things that blow around can cause some real damage to your property or if someone's out in that storm. So things like patio furniture, uh, that, that is the number one thing we see moved around the county is patio furniture, umbrellas especially. Uh, a lot of times we'll see a lot of damage from things tipping over uh, onto, uh, onto houses or onto cars. Uh, the, so the big thing is, is that, you know, that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's like when, when you get that chance, the opportunity to go ahead and kind of batten down the hatches, you, you're really going to want to take that opportunity. And if you've done the, the tree work, uh, that's the other thing that, that we see a lot of damage is of, of dead branches. And once the wind starts blowing, the trees start slapping together, and uh, things start falling. So one of the things uh, you'll want to do when you start, you know, and you know the storm is imminent, you're going to want to put things into sheds, put things into garages. How do I know when a storm is coming and I should sure. react? In uh, Hennepin County, they ha we have... Uh, well, the warning sirens that, that you hear, and you hear them tested on the first Wednesday of every month. So when you hear a siren, uh, the siren is a warning siren. It's an outdoor warning siren. So if you're outdoors, what you want to do is seek shelter or go indoors and then seek information. And it was designed to do that. Uh, when you hear that, that means when the siren goes off, a storm is approaching. It's not a warning that a storm is coming. So you'll hear two different types. On a Wednesday, when you hear the siren test, you'll hear a steady tone, which is severe weather. 
and then you hear a rising and falling tone, which is something like a gas leak or like if a rail car tipped over or something, you'd hear that. It's easy to mistake them though because most sirens, the modern sirens, rotate. So even though it's rotating, it might sound like it's rising and falling, it's still oh. a steady tone. So after the storm, a homeowner has a tree fall on their house, their car, it takes down power lines. What should they do at that point? One of the first things you want to do is make sure that you are, your house or whatever you're in is structurally sound. Don't walk out of something that's protecting you into something that's not. And keep in mind that uh, we love our trees in Minnesota. We, we, we absolutely do, and there's trees everywhere. And because there are trees everywhere, there's power lines running everywhere. And when a tree falls on a power line, a lot of times it gets wrapped, and you can't even see it. So if you walk outside and you see uh, a power line, assume that it's hot and that it is energized. You, it's, it's impossible for, for you without instrumentation to tell if that is hot or not. You also got to consider that the ground next to a down power line can become energized. Uh, chain link fences, any object in your yard can become energized. Um, you also have the possibility of back feeding. You know, if a, a neighbor were to start up a generator, even if the power to the entire neighborhood is out, someone can back feed that line through a generator. So you got to be cautious of that. If the trees or the damage is on the road, okay, if it's on a city street or a county road, there's a city worker or a county worker that is going to come and deal with that. So that is not your domain. And we want to make sure that people understand to leave that right where it is. And then as far as uh, in the yard, that's where, the, where ProTree would come in or a company like that to, to assess and help you with that. I'm a homeowner that has had a tree fall either on my house or my vehicle or done some property damage. What do I do? Assume that everything is unstable. Even if there's a tree that's fallen on your house or your car and it looks stable, uh, assume it's unstable. You know, keep your kids inside, keep your dog on a leash. Um, you know, if, if you're going to be making an insurance claim, it's, good, it's a good idea to take some pictures of those kinds of things. And um, yeah, then just do an assessment, walk all the way around. What do you think people should know about hiring a tree contractor after a storm? The first thing that you, you want to make sure of is that they're, they're properly insured, that they have both general liability insurance and workman's comp. And before you sign a contract or anyone commences any work, make sure, you know, it's, it's fairly easy these days with email to, to send a copy of that stuff over to you. You know, also get, get, get multiple estimates, get, you know, one or two estimates and uh, make sure that they're competitive and, <clears throat> and, and ask, them, ask, them how, ask them how they plan to perform the work. You know, what kind of equipment they'll be using, what kind of manpower, how they plan to access the trees or your yard. Um, make sure you ask if the de debris disposal is included and when that will be done. So let's talk a little bit about people trying to do their own tree work or uh, damage control and some chainsaw safety. One of the first things that we do, no matter if we're going to cut uh, on, a, on a road or anything, is we have to do a complete walk around to make sure we assess to make sure that it's safe. The, the first thing we want to make sure is, are those power lines. Because before we make, even start our saw, we want to make sure that there's no wires wrapped into that that's not going to cause us any harm. And the problem, as we discussed before, is you really can't tell if that line is hot. So we use equipment like, uh, this is called a V-Watch, and this would be something that we would carry in that as initial assessment. When it's in the case and it's closed, it, it won't go off. But once you expose it and it's designed with a lanyard to hang around your neck, what it does is it gives a warning beep like that. That tells you that the line is hot. The closer you get, the more the beep. So if this was a power line laying on the road, you can't tell if this is hot. And if you walked up and looked at it, there'd be no way. But if you take an instrument that tells you right there that that line is hot, and then we're going to make sure that we have all of the proper PPE before we start a saw. So that P your PPE is just like ours. We have our personal protective equipment as firefighters, and so do people in your, your business as people who use chainsaws. You know, if you're going to try and clean up um, after a storm yourself, you need to make sure that you have all the same PPE that we do. And you know, all this stuff is available at your, your local hardware store or you know, corner store, so wherever you can buy chainsaws and those types of related tools and equipment. If you think about it, I mean, if you look at what we have right, right in front of us here, and we, we look at a normal pair of chaps, they're right around $100. 
Um, you can get some that might, might be a little, uh, a little less than that, but what you want to do is make sure that they are approved, okay? And what they are is they are, it, there's Kevlar inside, and that's not to say that, that it's puncture proof, but what the Kevlar actually does is run from the top to the bottom in strands. And if that is breached by a saw, what it does is it actually pulls those strands out and stops the, blade, the chain from going around. So that would be a, a pair of chaps, do that. And then there's a couple of examples of chainsaw pants. If you don't protect yourself, accidents will happen. Wes, when do you put your personal protective equipment on? So when we're out working, I won't even get out of the truck without putting my helmet on. Um, it becomes kind of a comfort thing. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of injuries over the years and I know what can happen in this line of work. So it, it becomes second nature to us. So for me, I'm gonna, my hearing protection drops down. And so before I start my saw, I put my hearing protection on. Before I run my saw, I put the face shield down because anything that flies up and hits me in the face, it protects me from that. Why don't we talk about what to do when you're starting a saw, like how to hold it and what you should do to start it. Sure. Well, the first thing I want to talk about, Kelly, is the five safety features on your chainsaw. So I'll run you through them quick. The first one is going to be your chain break. And that's here. And this is, this is similar to like the safety on, on a gun. You want to keep that on at all times, even if, even if you're not if you're not cutting wood, just put it on. Make your cut, put the chain brake back on. And that's another thing that's kind of second nature to us is we just always, when you're walking around, anytime you're not act actively cutting, put that chain brake on and make sure it works. Before you start the saw, put it on, try and move your chain back and forth. That'll tell you whether or not it's working. Uh, the second one is your ignition interlock switch. That's right here. So that, that, that makes sure that if you were to accidentally bump the throttle, you can't do it unless you have your hand fully wrapped around the handle of the saw. Then you're able to engage the throttle there. Um, next is your kill switch. You want to make sure that, that that's functioning properly. Last is your chain catch. That's this piece of aluminum down here at the bottom. That, that protects you from the chain. If the chain were to pop off the bar of the saw and come mm -hmm. spinning back at you, it would, it would catch on there and it would stop it from, from hitting you. And finally is your right hand uh, your right hand guard. So that's again, if the chain were to come dislodge, your hand would be wrapped around here on the saw and that would protect the chain from hitting your hand there. The, uh, the one thing that everybody looks at and, and sometimes overlooks are, these are called dogs. And what these are, these little, they look like little spears. That's so that when you go into the wood and you can use it as a fulcrum to, when you're cutting, make sure that those are tight. If any of this stuff is loose, or missing that Wes or myself have talked about, then the saw, you shouldn't run it because it's not safe. So do we want to start a saw and show people how to do that? Yeah, we want to show you there's two different methods that there's only two ways to safely start a chainsaw. The first one is called the, the leg lock method and Kelly's going to show you that one. And I'm then gonna, the second I'm one- I'm going to have you go ahead and stand <laughs> over there. I'd be delighted to. Thank you. The second one's called the foothold and I'm going to show you that one. So the saw, We'll go, you hold it in your left hand right at the arch, so your saw is at an angle. When you put it in between your legs, it locks in, okay? It can't move, it won't move. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to pull a full stroke with the cord. If you use this hand, you only get this much. So make sure that your saw is ready to go and your chain brake is on, and when you pull it, It's, it's just nice and easy and it doesn't move. The other method I'm gonna show you is called the, uh, the foothold technique. So we, you can use this on a little bit bigger of a chainsaw, but what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to take one knee, lock your foot into the saw there, make sure your chain brake is on and double check it with your hand. Put the saw on um, full choke and you're gonna to wanna to just give it one pull and the saw should turn over. If you have a uh, decompression valve, you can hit that at the same time too. You always wanna make sure you have two hands on the saw, one on the rear hand of the saw, and one on the front hand of the saw with your thumbs wrapped all the way around the chainsaw. Just by doing that and wearing the proper protective equipment that we're wearing today, you're 75% less likely to have a chainsaw related accident. Kelly, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our audience that we have not already talked about? You know, really, it, what it really boils down to is be safe. Um, the, uh, the county is, is, is going to get out there after a storm as quickly as they can, 
uh, they're sending uh, the, the right people with the right tools. And so the best thing to do is go ahead and let them just do their job. Make sure you know your limitations and if you're concerned at whether or not you can clean up some tree debris or a down tree after a storm, if you think you might not be able to do it, just, 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 just wait and contact a professional and get a couple estimates on it. Thank you so much for both of you being here today. I know your schedules are really busy and you've got a lot to do.